I'm Ashley of X of Words. I'm Connor Goldsmith. And I'm Carla Dan. Hey everybody, welcome to the big crossover we are calling Referential 97. So go listen to Khalid's podcast and this is also it's Words 97. We have great nerd guests talking to us about X-Men 97, the nostalgia cartoon that we are loving slash eating slash crying about slash obsessed with slash don't want to be obsessed with. Can I just say, it's really a thing for me that you both are here on this audio recording that we're doing. I like to think of you as my mommy and daddy podcast. A little. <laughs> That's kind of sexy. <laughs> I'm a child of divorce, so I never have my parents together. So like, I never when feel When did Ash way. and I divorce? <laughs> I feel like we co-parent really well, I, if we did. Well, in real life, in real life. So this is a big thing for me that I have both my parents here and they're getting At along. At once. You know, that is nice. It's more like I'm a clone of Jean Grey and he's Cyclops <laughs> or vice versa. And we didn't have an opportunity to be together in your life, but it wasn't that we like chose to, you know, break the home. There are all sorts of different families getting so, dear listener, this is what happens when you try to be on a podcast episode with Connor and Khalid, and it becomes very apparent that they have a long-running, existing friendship, and you haven't said a word in maybe 17 minutes. Ash is also here, by the I'm way. I'm here. Hi. You're a co-host, bitch. You can speak. <laughs> Listen, I, I said last episode I spoke too much, and this is perfect. I don't... No, no, I want you to talk. I want I you to, to talk. Do shit. You have such a great voice, though. He does, doesn't he? I, I also have a pillow and a duvet two hand and I can get real snuggly. Not a just duvet. Like... So, okay, this is something that freaked me out. I'm sorry. Now I'm, I'm sorry. Now I'm doing it. I This is something that we also have a slight delay, guys, because I'm in New York. I'm actually in Westchester uh, uh, for a family thing, which is appropriate for this episode because aren't we all now back in Westchester spiritually? <laughs> this is the thing that freaked me out when I was in London a couple years back is that apparently in the UK, you don't have a top sheet. You just have a lower <laughs> sheet and then the duvet. Yeah. Yeah. We sleep. There's also a sheet on top of you before the duvet. Yeah, see that? And I don't understand. I've heard about I that. I don't like a duvet because I run hot at night. Mm -hmm. So I throw the duvet off and I just sleep with like the top sheet on. But I felt, and this is just a lot for your podcast. I'm sorry. I also, I sleep nude. So I felt very exposed in this British hotel because I was just like, well, I guess I'm just not going to have covers on. Mm -hmm. And like, what? I mean, you know, housekeeping is not going to just walk in, but like. I don't want to like me to the housekeeper. Bottoms up and a double F's. So I called down and they were like, oh, American, we'll send you a top sheet. And I was like, okay, thank you. There's a lot to adjust to in the UK. But that's weird. Why didn't you have one? Girls. <laughs> you two, you two are like, you two are physically incapable of not running over each other. Like there's a 20% overlap with every sentence you've said so far. So it's called collaborative I'll, overlap. Thank you. We're just harmonizing. I'll I'll play I'll I'll play the mid. I'll play the middle. Okay. Thank you. Referee for us. So yes, <laughs> we, we, we don't have a sheet. Sleeping nude under a thin blanket feels like a wartime scenario that I feel very distressed <laughs> by it, but if you, <laughs> if you feel cool <laughs> with it, excellent. I'm sorry that England could not accommodate your need to be just they cold. They did. No, they bit. did. I just had to ask. Oh, dear. I hope you didn't have to tell them the whole story. No, but now I have. <laughs> I'm <laughs> naked, charity. and I'd like a very thin blanket. <laughs> Welcome to our recap of X-Men 97. This is Referential 97, where I'm doing collaboration with my good friend Ash of the Immortal X Awards podcast. Hello, hello. Today we have with us the one, the only, Connor Goldsmith of the Cerebro podcast. Say hello, Connor. Hi, everybody. It's great to be here. <laughs> Ash is going to make fun of me this whole time and I'm going to be so embarrassed, but it's fine because I've <laughs> no. missed him. So. No. Hi, everyone. Hi, it's me. It's Ash. You'd think that three people with their own shows could do this more organically on the fly, but now you see the reality, which is that it's us building the plane as we fall through the air. <gasps> so welcome to this uh, lovely little bit of chaos that we've sliced off for you tonight. We are going to be talking about X-Men 97 episode three. Who wants to take the episode synopsis? I took notes. I can do it if do you it. want to do it. Go, Go for it. it. Go for it. I'll do Go it fast. It. I swear to God. Okay. Time me. So previously on X-Men, no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. 
I did make a note that Gene's vision of like the master mold future where everything blows up is straight up ripped directly from Sailor Moon S. It's Ray's mm-hmm. vision from the season premiere of that. And then there was a Sailor Moon transformation sequence. And so I was like, they know. But anyway, this episode is by Bo DeMeo and Charlie Freeman, I think. It's a co-write. I looked them up. They are they them pronouns. So I just want to make sure we get that right. So basically the, the cliffhanger last episode was in the previous episodes, we've seen Gene give birth and all of that. And now another Gene has shown up at the door and is like, I need the X-Men. Everyone's like, Gene? And then they look back at our Gene from the first two episodes who looks pissed. I'll tell you I'm doing not well, bitch. And confused, which it turns out is fair. So in this episode, basically it's an adaptation of the, the Gene and Madeline stuff from Inferno, very loosely, but emotionally, I think gets at the heart of a lot of it. Basically, they're all like, well, Beast ran some tests and this new Gene is the one who's like accurately as old as Gene is supposed to be and your DNA is looking weirdly fresh. Why is it spicy? So we're going to have to figure this out. And she's like, why won't anybody believe me? And Scott is like, we just need to be sure, Jean. And so she goes off to uh, the baby's room to be with Nathan. And this was good. It's the scene from like the orphanage where Mr. Sinister reveals it all. But here he delivers it to her through the baby monitor, which I thought was a cute detail. And he basically tells her like, I created you. So it's the cartoon Sinister voice, which I cannot do without like a vocoder. But he's like, I created you. And now I will have your child. Yes, my queen. Your your royal or whatever <laughs> and he activates her sleeper programming and turns her into the goblin queen she then does an inferno but just in the x-mansion because we've only got 20 mm-hmm. minutes and it's a 90s cartoon so we don't go anywhere else yeah. right <laughs> Not right now, anyway. We don't have time. Uh, And we don't have time is sort of the theme of this new show. And I think this new show is really good, by the way. I was like very like, "Mm, I don't know. But I actually am really enjoying myself. It is very obvious that it's like we have eight 30-minute episodes and we got to hit all these marks. Because like have the baby... Baby gets infected, lose the baby in three quick. episodes, yeah. right? It's like pretty wild. She got mad so quickly. <laughs> well, they had to make it like Mr. Sinister just flicks a switch, you know? And like, so suddenly she has demon powers. Why? Unexplained. <laughs> Doesn't really matter. The point is that Jennifer Hale is serving cunt on a mm-hmm. silver platter for the next like 15 minutes. <laughs> The X-Men fight with Madeline, who's not called Madeline yet. They're they're calling her Jean, but like we all know it's Madeline, the Goblin Queen, let's say. And she fights Magneto and it's pretty cool. She gets a moment where like she, uh, Magneto's like, my magnetism. And she's like, yeah, can you do shit with the glass? Because I'm going (laughs) to use the glass then, which is fun. Because telekinesis is just a straight up upgrade on magnetism. This is why like Lorna is always so pissed because Jean is just like effortlessly can do everything. It's like, it's very Storm and Bobby. It's like Mm. anything you can do, I can do better, right? Yeah, but you know, just like yeah. deal with it, my friend. But not important. On topic. Point is, it ends with Jean. The, the real Jean has gotten her memories back because she and Logan were like kind of getting sensual. But she immediately goes Scott, which was funny. That made me laugh in the theater. She does an astral projection. It's cool. She like confronts Maddie. She ends up psychically dragging Maddie into her own womb to experience the birth of Nathan from Nathan's perspective, which is insane. This is an insane sequence for like ostensibly the Fox Kids cartoon, right? I was shocked by how adult they let this episode be in a good way. I thought it was cool. Like, like horror movie stuff, too, was like very gory in a way that the original cartoon would never have gotten away with. Mm-hmm. And she had her thighs out, which like she does not in the action figure. So okay. I was like, OK, girl. But that's the end of the episode, because basically Jean snaps her out of it. The sinister gem shatters on her forehead because she knows she realizes I love my baby. And even if I'm not the real Jean, he's my baby. And so she and Scott team up to fight Sinister. But Sinister has already infected Cable with the techno organic virus. In this continuity, he's doing it to make him invulnerable, like an Achilles kind of thing. But they interrupt the process and now he's fucked. And because we can't use Rachel because there's only one Rachel so you can't have Rachel in this cartoon the sidestep that's clever here is that Bishop takes the baby into the future instead Mm -hmm. it's also it's a nice that's a nice bit for Bishop and Cable like to have in this because Bishop and Cable have like complicated stuff so it adds a layer for fans who know from the comics Mm. and they're gonna go meet up with Forge in the future so then we cut to Forge in the present where he's meeting up with Storm the breeze is gone for life death and that's the end of the episode oh except Jean is like other Jean stay here this is your home too and she's like actually I'm gonna get out of here picked a new name it's Madeline Pryor for some reason just call me that I'm heading out I got a suitcase (laughs) we're Gucci but like I need to not be here and it's Maddie who sends the baby to the future because Scott like can't deal with it and Mm -hmm. I was like that's a little bit harsh on Scott and you know that I'm not the kind of person who likes to (laughs) defend Scott so that's the recap that was the whole episode X-Men 
that was how great. long was that? That was pretty good. So it's eleven minutes. It was good. I did not recap for eleven <laughs> minutes. <laughs> yeah. Really? That, that's yeah. good. All right. So, how do we all feel about this episode? I think Ash should go first. Yes. <laughs> go, Ash. You've been very silent. What do I think of the episode? I think this was a. I mean, it leads on the action. I I really love the way that they've given us a really strong like action set piece in every episode, and they've just wrapped fucking years of lore around it in a way that is so condensed like you know that you know that meme of that cat that little kitten that's on the the biker's shoulder with the wind going through his face that is nathan that is nathan's experience of this story <laughs> so far the child has been conceived born attacked dunked and thrown into the future in 15 straight minutes like hair peeled back thank god no, i'm glad they got the baby out of there like enough is enough yeah well sure because it doesn't i mean the second you have a baby in a superhero comic the problem is how are we going to get rid of the baby right and like that becomes a dilemma for the next writer to deal with uh, and in claremont's case where it was just him and then louise it was like well shit what the fuck are we going to do <laughs> marinate it apparently yeah put it in a jar yeah i mean i i liked the moment when Sinister just sort of drops him in the in the tank <laughs> like he's a, like he's a goldfish. There was no way. I also like that there was no like monologuing for the baby. If if I'll say anything for Sinister in this show, that motherfucker is efficient. <laughs> oh yeah, he's a very different character in the cartoon. He had one seven second conversation with Jean. She went evil like this. <laughs> Death to all of them. Oh, Jesus. She went from mother to homicide over one baby monitor conversation. Mm -hmm. He got his hands on that baby straight in the water like he was on Straight in the water. We got, we got 30 minutes. It's a tight 30. One and a half of those are previously on X-Men. One of them is the, I gotta be honest, kind of cheap looking recreation of the opening credits that we've done. Ooh. <laughs> It is though. It is. It is. I got. I got to be real. I so I went to the okay. premiere in LA, and mm. so it was also it was on like a movie size screen, which okay. like is not really fair to anything that's not supposed to be viewed that way, right? Yeah. yeah. But I, I so I love that this show is hand drawn and it looks really good. And like to be clear, the original '90s cartoon was extremely poor quality animation for the most yes. part. So it's not like it's any worse. It's just what's weird about this one is you can tell there was a lot of money sunk into it. I love that it's hand drawn because so few cartoons are anymore but it does feel like certain set pieces actually this whole episode looks great mm -hmm. the previous episode like magneto is lifting everybody up into space and stuff yeah. that looked incredible but i find the like one-on-one -on -one fight scene stuff to look pretty choppy like the keyframes look great if you screenshot it it looks great but the motion between the keyframes there's that scene in the first episode i think where cyclops is like fighting a friends of humanity guy and it just it kind of like it kind of gave naruto to me a little <laughs> bit you know what i mean <laughs> yeah, and like I not you. early naruto and i'm not like a naruto head i've just seen the videos comparing early yeah. naruto and later naruto i hear you i want to be really forgiving of it because um i'm just happy like you said to the animation i'm just happy i like it so yeah. like i'm overall like that's why i'm saying like these are my tiny tiny yeah. quibbles uh but yeah. overall it really it slays and the animation in this one really the fight scenes in particular i thought were so good i think you can tell where the budget goes like they mm -hmm. really put the budget into those fight scenes because as soon as people start throwing hands shit looks very expensive they were like we want to see your nose bleed in 4k the conversation mama good luck like <laughs> well that's because a different studio is animating the fight scenes oh yeah. that makes a ton of okay because it's a little bit flash video mm -hmm. at times when they're all just talking. The White Queen welcomes you to die. Yeah. But then, like, suddenly it's like, oh, it's go time. Like, we got power <laughs> signatures. And then you're like, okay, this looks expensive. So, yes. you know, I mean, look, it's an experiment. And I think it's been a successful experiment. Yeah. And I am excited to see where they go from here. I hope that they get more episodes next season so they can chill yes. out a little bit more. Because I do think the breakneck pace of the plot is a little frenetic. Yeah, I did want to hit on that point a little bit. Can we talk about the amalgamation of stories that have been fit into the one episode? Now, all three of us are comic book people. That is how we got into the X-Men and that is why we love them. Just watching this episode, there were five different monumental issues that could have been the season long arc that just happened in one episode. How do we feel about that? The last episode, we were talking about how we really appreciated how this is truly an adaptation. It is doing the same thing the 90s cartoons did. It took stories that we know and put them in a different context. But I think this episode, it, it hit me. Oh, I would have liked to see this Maddie story play out for three episodes at least. If it were me, mm -hmm. I had... The the time to like shake out the arc I think mm -hmm. there are a couple things I would do differently but I also haven't seen the whole thing so it's possible that I'm just not seeing the big picture mm. I think that 
I mean, first of all, this is just a note that is more about the previous episodes, but it is crazy to me that they had Storm cut her hair before. Yeah, yeah. The eye catch at the end of this episode. Like she should have been regular 90s Storm, lost the powers, and then you have her do. Everybody loves a woman cuts her hair in a dramatic fashion scene. Like do the haircut with the leather for life death. I think that would have felt more natural because right now, I'm, and listen, she did the haircut before she lost her powers in the comics. So it's not, but again, we're adapting. You know, I would have had Jean be Jean for like five or six episodes and then drop the two Jeans bomb like episode five or six and made it hurt more. Yeah. I hear you. I hear you. But if you only have eight and it's not the Madeline Pryor show, much as I would like it to be. I get that, like, you have a certain economy of time, right? Like, it's about the real estate, like they would say in a comic. I, the reason I didn't like the 90s cartoon as a kid is because I was that annoying kid who was like, that's not how it happened in the comics. But now, as an adult, I was looking at this, and what's interesting about this is, like, this plot, which is how did Cable come to be and get to the future, is a plot that is born out of Chris Claremont writing himself out of, like, six different editorial mandates that fucked up his whole storyline, right? So like the mere exist, the death of Jean, the mere existence of Madeline, Scott and Madeline not getting to live happily ever after, Jean coming back, Scott and Jean have to be superheroes now, so what do we do with the baby? By the way, editorial says you have to kill off Madeline. Like all of this comes out of him mm -hmm. wrangling first with Jim Shooter and then with Bob Harris, right? I think that when you're adapting it, it makes much more sense to make certain choices that are just, easier like the way that you just wrap the techno organic virus plot into the sinister thing here because that's way less complicated than involving apocalypse and all of that yeah and my friend hobby pointed this out, i had forgotten this mr sinister was involved in the phalanx stuff in the 90s cartoon so it actually is a callback to this continuity i then asked i was like did storm and forge never meet in the 90s cartoon because that's crazy if they didn't yeah. apparently they didn't so i i liked that i think for me, what's hard is that what I love about Madeline is Madeline, the yeah. character. And there is no Madeline really in this. It's Jean bifurcated with all of Jean's memories who thinks she's Jean. And I think that that works better for an audience that doesn't have time to get to love Madeline over three years first because they already love Jean. They're already invested. I think that that was a choice that made sense even if it's not like my ideal but as an adaptation choice I was like that's really smart. How about you Ash? I I think this is perfect actually. I, and I think as three law heads it's really easy for us to automatically do what the download of like yeah. The comparison of three different things, but I think that I've, I've made a one assumption, which is actually X Men '97 is not for really new X-Men fans because it crunches things together and it feels like a tapas for people who have had the full meal already and mm, I love yeah. that I feel like it, as much as I've heard people say that they'd stretch it out I think it's the perfect length because I know all of these stories and I know them twice I read them in the comics I watched them in the original cartoon and now like I just get to like mm -mm, oh yeah mm -mm. little cayenne little time nice I get like a little taste we meet we move on and, and I think that's <laughs> amazing because the big fear I had with the nostalgia bait was that mm -hmm. they were going to take us all the way back to square one and then drag us very slowly through yeah. stories that we know front to back. And at this pace, season two, we could be at Academy X. <laughs> right. Do you, do you know, and it's giving me energy that maybe we end up somewhere interesting. It also, I thought, you can tell that the people working on this really do love the comics because you don't have to do Madeline Pryor. Mm. I was worried that it was just going to be a Gene goes crazy yeah. arc when they first premiered the thing and that Gene was just going to be Nathan's biological mother and we were going to skip it entirely. You didn't have to do this. So in the context of no one who watched that cartoon in the 90s knows who the fuck Madeline Pryor is if they didn't read comics or if they do they just know that gene has an evil twin because they saw a trading card or whatever so this yeah. i thought was a really smart way to do it you draw on the emotional connection that the viewer already has with gene but also you let maddie be genuinely betrayed by the way that they all immediately turn on her because of like one test that hank did Please, yeah how dare you the, the yeah. feeling of just go scott like all of the beats from the comic that make it emotionally work still happen here i just i thought it was really smart this was the episode where i I watched it I was because I, I liked the first two fine but yeah. I watched this one I was like they're cooking with this though like this is like this is really smart in the way that they're doing it yeah okay so out of a scale of 97 can you both give me <laughs> 
<laughs> can, can you both give me your rating for the episode? We tried this before and it fucking <laughs> bombed. Which is why I'm keeping it. I'm not a math gay. Like, I don't, I'm not Alan Turing. What the fuck? Like, out of 97, what's the fraction? No, it wasn't, that- it wasn't even the people had to do math. It was that they just started making shit up. Somebody <laughs> said they were going to give a 95 because they like 1995. And I was like, well. <laughs> and I like it. <laughs> I so my only like demerit for this episode, if I'm looking through like the negatives I have, yeah. the sunspot and jubilee thing is insane. So like that's just sort of an overall like this is crazy <laughs> to me thing that I can, and I know that's because I'm a comics fan and like these characters are completely like sunspot yeah. is a completely different guy here. But I'm like mm. this is Ricky Martin. This isn't sunspot. Them watching a scary movie together so that they can like touch hands in the popcorn box. I'm like this makes me want to die. But so that that's like a one point off. And then. How do y'all feel about Bishop in this? Um, hmm. So, Bishop, again, is background. There are a couple of people who are background in this. And Bishop, yeah. to me, is very, very background. He turns up, he gets hit with things. People shoot him. They turn up so he they shoot can... Someone, yeah, so someone can shoot him and he can shoot them back. And you go, yay. And then he babysits the kid and gets sent off as a male mammy into the future to take care of somebody else's baby. Mm. Okay. That mm, that didn't quite occur to me, but you're you're not wrong. I mean, no. better than in the comics, his relationship with babies. Oh, yeah. true, true. Oh. But at least then he was leading his own story at least then yeah, he yeah. had he was like the narrative lead now yeah storm is gone depowered bishop is gone to the future and it's like ah nostalgia <laughs> yes yeah, so. sure i mean i i think that with storm it's complicated because that is her best story in my opinion bar none is life death yeah i disagree really that's where I i'm disagree. at okay well then now our doings oh well i look look I would take a bullet for Al Ewing, but I mean, if I, I don't like to say something's the best thing ever until at least like five years have passed and I've got <laughs> time to think about it. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's for me, that's a, that's a strong number two at the moment. But for okay. me, like the life death arc, like Japan and the Mohawk through losing the powers through fall of the mutants when she gets them back. Yeah. Like to me, that is just like peak Claremont Storm, that 80s arc. So I wow. think it's cool that they're adapting it. It is like a bummer that it means like the best thing about Storm in the cartoon, which is her big like we got a really great one in the first episode because they knew they were going to take it away from us. Yeah. But it is a bummer to lose that when like to me that's the most important thing about the cartoon is this actress who they got mm-hmm. back doing those speeches. Um, I think Connor and I aligned and we like Storm when she's in not goddess mode when that is being challenged. At least that's why I enjoy Storm the most well, for me like that she's forced to like think about it or like reflect on it expectation yeah life right. death is really the only story where that really happens so and everything else is very much about storm as the goddess and it's like all right that, that, that's my perspective i think life death is a, is a cool story i think it's yeah. a cool story a lot of people's you see it with broader x-men fandom empathy for my marginalized people is often only available to them with pity i can only sure. i can only relate to you and root for you as a marginalized person if i can pity your situation which is why krakoa turned off so many people because suddenly mutants weren't pitiable enough what do you right. mean they were they were saying well fuck you then and it, that made everyone yeah. really mad it, if exactly. they didn't identify with the minority experience right. right because if i can't be sad for you or see you getting kicked in the stomach why should i empathize with you and i think that comes to a point with storm as the canonically most marginalized person on the X-Men team and also one of the most powerful is that people go, oh, well, I can only relate it to Storm if we strip all of her powers and throw her on the floor and roll her in the mud. And that's really when you get to see and relate to her. When, whereas when you have Jean, who is also an Omega level female mutant, who, who never is depowered in the same way, yeah. who is only ever given more power, her Jean's thing is how does she reckon with it? How does she stay a hold of yeah. who she is through that empowerment? And so you've got a white woman, a black woman on the same team, and one has to be dragged down, and the other is given cosmic power upon cosmic power upon omega power. It's interesting because this is the plot Claremont wanted to do with Jean first. Yes. This was Claremont's resolution to Dark Phoenix was supposed to be, well, Jean's proven she can't hang with this. Yeah. So right. she's going to lose her powers, and that's where Madeline Pryor initially comes from, is that he liked the idea of Jean with no powers and a gun flying the plane and like all of that. Yeah. And so when he couldn't do it with Jean because the editors were like, no, you have to kill her, the genocide was too serious but he was interested in what happens if the god loses their power and so he did it with storm who was his favorite character and i do agree that there is an issue in fandom with storm where it's a tricky situation for any writer right because i i do think that 
the stories that are not just about her powers are the stories for me where she gets the most interiority. Mm -hmm. So it's like the 80s Claremont stuff to me is like the most anyone besides Al, honestly, has ever given a shit about Storm as a person, as a character. And what's really cool about Al and his run and what I think is so impressive about it is the way that he has done that without... Having to strip her. Exactly. He, He made the toys around her as big as her so that she couldn't solve everything with a power and also divorced her from a lot of physical conflict. The landing point I kind of wanted to make on that is that in this series that I, A, know is very, very action driven. Mm. uh, And I said this in the last one is that I really hope that Storm isn't now just relegated to the choppy talking scenes that we know aren't the big engine of the cartoon. You know, I hope the hand-to-hand shit is really hitting. This happens specifically to black women a lot in fiction. Like Monica Rambo had the same shit happen to her. It is something that just happens over and over because we can allow a white person in a comic to be Thor, but yeah. like you can't be Thor, Monica Rambo. Like that is a that is a recurring issue and I agree. Jean though is also historically most interesting to me either when her powers have been downgraded, like when uh, Louise Simonson was writing her in X Factor and she couldn't use her telepathy. And it was really frustrating for her. And mm-hmm. we got, again, to see more of her thoughts and like what she was feeling as opposed to power feats. Then also, though, in the same way that Al really embodied Storm as the goddess in this run, Grant Morrison's gene where it's like, no, I am God and you're going to deal with it yeah. is like my absolute favorite gene. So I think you can do both. And I get that in the context of this cartoon where the best parts are these action set pieces, it is a bummer that she's not going to be able to use her powers. On the other hand, I was just like, I left and I turned to my friend I was with and we were just like, we're so excited for that actress to get to do life death. Yeah. Cause that's like a cool thing to get to do. But 30 years later to come back to this role and do like her most emotional mm powerful story if it's written well and if the animation looks good but hopefully it will be and they will yeah just take us back to what started this goddamn tangent uh <laughs> bishop was i reading out of 97 i asked about bishop i asked what you guys thought of bishop in this yeah, yeah. Jesus. to get on this storm conversation is interesting because it made me think of the concern i had when this was first announced is that storm was kind of going to be relegated into the feet queen you know what i mean where like she does something mm-hmm. impressive mm-hmm. but never has a story like in the original cartoon mm-hmm. and the <laughs> comics for about 20 years for a while yeah. where she just showed yeah, up yeah, to yeah, like yeah. do a lightning bolt the 90s is one of her worst yeah. eras comics wise too because it's just not really yeah and i think when it comes to that my fears when it comes to storm are slightly more abated with bishop at the moment we've only just seen him be a feet queen you know (laughs) unlike storm i'm not convinced he's going to come back until the last two episodes in the finale to do something really big i think they're doing a parallel forge thing where he's in the future with future forge Mm -hmm. and then storms in the present with present forge and then the plot lines will converge that's my guess because he's like i know a guy like he can build anything you know Mm -hmm. and forge is an important character in Bishop's timeline in Mm -hmm. the comics. My thing is like, Bishop was not a main cast member in the original show, right? Mm -hmm. Like he was a guest star who people really liked and he is definitely like seen as a nostalgic member of that 90s team, even though he's not in the Jim Lee Claremont relaunch, he comes a little bit later. Yeah, Mm -hmm. But like he was definitely perceived as like a core 90s X-Man by fans, I would say. Mm -hmm. So I get beefing up his role, especially because I do think that this production is interested in exploring more of like the minority right. analog stuff and, and trying to emphasize diverse cast members, right? So mm. I think that that makes sense. But I think if you're going to do it, you really got to do it. I'm yeah. like, like the next episode should be a Bishop episode, right? Yeah. Like that's the, because I do, I do get what you're saying. My thing was more about how he's characterized and I don't remember how he was characterized in the 90s cartoon originally, but like this guy does not feel like Bishop to me, but I I more know the comics character who's like kind of a serious cop Mm. type. Yeah. Right. I also always want him to have the Australian accent, which I know he only has when Chris Claremont writes him. Don't worry about us, Dingo. We'll make sure we can. But he does in my head because of Extreme X-Men. But I know he didn't in the old cartoon, but like he was like quipping in a way that I like don't associate with Bishop. I don't think of him as like, an Iceman or Spider-Man type, like making jokes, you know? Yeah, I, I also, I think there's a couple of characters that have kind of experienced that a little bit because Beast to me feels so one-dimensional. He doesn't even feel like a character. He, he has to be exposition. there when, yeah, when there's exposition to make her a science-y thing to say, this gene has no paws. She is so beautiful. I've never seen a bad picture of her, ever. <laughs> <laughs> Jealous. Do you know what I mean? And- okay, are you two going to give me your rating number now, please? <laughs> Ha ha ha!
<laughs> fine, fine, fine. I rate this one a... Actually, I, I rate this one like a 92 out of 97. Yeah, that's... I'm going to give it a 91 for the 91 X-Men relaunch. This is about <laughs> as good as this could have been without little niggling things that are for me as a yeah. Madeline Pryor fan. The, the, the choices that were made here were smarter than the choices I would have made as like a fangirl you know what yeah. i mean so i thought that it was good i actually and do you know what you said that you didn't like the whole sunspot jubilee thing say more i actually kind of like that i don't like who sunspot is to me they're just both so gay that i'm like what is this but like if in x-men 03 seven seasons from now they're like that was hilarious we're both gay like that i would be but the thing is i feel like they're both kind of gay now <laughs> <laughs> well, no, but that's, and it's very 90s to date your lesbian bestie. I've been there. You know, it's not that I don't see that. I think there's just a lot about this version of Sunspot that I'm a little confused. Yeah. He's not Sunspot. He's yeah. meant to be a stand-in for a particular sort of marginalized person. He's basically just meant to be that. The respectability politics, if I keep my head low, I'll be okay type person. I think you could have used like Prodigy or someone and it would have worked better. I just say Prodigy because we did that episode together. But like, you know what I mean? Like, I get that you want a character who existed in 1997, right? Yeah. But Sunspot to me is just such a like, and he they have the flashy money stuff in this. The note that I took, and this is like such a dumb nerd thing to ping on. They do the bit in this episode where like the monster turns into his like Brazilian mother who's like yelling at him. Yeah. And Sunspot's mother is a white woman in the comics. And that's like a really important part of his whole deal mm -hmm. is that like his mom is a white woman who was always away on archaeological digs and he has has this like fraught relationship with her and she's not in brazil considered mm -hmm. like as ethnic as he is yeah. and and she's called nina da costa in the credits so i was like well damn you read the comic she's in because <laughs> that's not a name most people fucking know i only know it because i reread those comics recently for the magma episode so like you <laughs> oh, know God. she was in the rainforest studying the sun before she died yeah i guess well or she hooked up with magma and she was <laughs> like i got a trick for blonde white women from brazil <laughs> that you're gonna love with that monster is that it seems to be mixing up a lot of different people's races because the shard was looking a bit just light uh, for my taste. I think shard was always kind of light in the old cartoon, wasn't she though? Like lighter but than I Bishop. don't approve of it and I think they should have fixed it. I I'm not saying you should. I just... <laughs> Thank you. How dare you? Race? <laughs> I also thought that, to be fair, that the parents of color or non-color mm. in the comic, I took the note, Jean's parents are off-model. Yeah. When we saw them, it, like... Jean is off-model. She has blue eyes. Yeah. Well, that that's... The old cartoon did that, though, which drives me fucking mm. crazy, is, like, the... Because I'm like, that's so easy, guys. But the comics messed that up. The funniest is there's a... Ash is pulling us back. We're pulling <laughs> yeah. it back around. Uh, I'm going to say 91. I liked it a lot. And no, out of 97, <laughs> I think that's pretty good, right? <laughs> <laughs> this is this was never gonna go the way you wanted it to go. I <laughs> opened with I, I need you guys to keep me on tap. <laughs> That's true. It's okay. That's true. All right. <laughs> At the same time, I'm going to pull us back to episode three, because between us three, we can go everywhere. <laughs> For hours. Yeah. So no, please do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But to pull us back to episode three of X-Men 97, tell me then, tell me the bits that a couple of days on actually still stick in your head. Carl, you want to go first? For me, it was when Scott hit Maddie and then she like looked back at him and just like just swiped that red lipstick on her to me that was the gayest moment of yeah. the episode by the way but also that's from Hellion is it that's from Zeb Wells' Hellion with her and Havoc that was just hot that was cute I was like look at the Krakoa comics already making their way into adaptation great scene and but the way that that was animated too looked great it did when she like smoothed it over her lip I was like this episode's expensive like cause that <laughs> yes that's some hand drawn shit right there it you is. know it looks like it looked like a Disney movie like it was like <laughs> that, that was very like Little Mermaid or like turning herself hot or whatever like it had that kind of energy to it I loved that whole scene i love the basic instinct yes the uncross so the good. legs uncross yeah i should have you as a toy i loved the i know not what i do <laughs> Jennifer Hale is just like a voice actress I've loved my whole life, right? Yeah. She's a perfect choice for Jean and Madeline because she can really do... She, the thing about Jennifer Hale is all her voices are kind of the same voice, yeah. but like she's such a good actress. It's perfect here because in this case, you want both of the voices to be the same voice and just the yeah. acting is the difference. So it works really, really, really well. I loved all the banter. I loved the green and purple choice for the magical oh, effects. Yeah. Did you think it was magic? Because she had absolutely no magical training. Why 
why are there demons? Why is it the Goblin Queen? Mm. Beast has a throwaway line where he's like, I guess Mr. Sinister likes Dante's Inferno. And I'm like, okay, but like, why? And yeah. I get that it's because we don't have time. But yeah. the thing that this adaptation loses for me, even like leaving aside my little things, the most important thing to me about Madeline Pryor's story is that she chooses that power for herself yeah. mm. and takes it and uses it to actualize herself. And here it's just like sort of a thing Sinister does to her. Yeah. But I did like that once she breaks free, she immediately starts co-parenting with Scott as like a healthy divorced mom immediately. Like, let's go get our son back. Like, fuck this yeah. guy. There are all sorts of different families getting really probably one of my favorite moments of the episode is just towards the end the scene between her and Jean where she just reveals her drag name just call me Madeline Pryor and it's like <laughs> why it's because like, it sounds On fucking pussy <laughs> And you know what? Jean is a fucking ally and she knows better than to ask questions like that. No, yeah. She's, she's MJP, honey. MJP. Madeline Jennifer Pryor. It's I got a new birth certificate and everything. <laughs> no, you forget it. I gave myself a middle name. MJP! <laughs> You have to let your stunt queen stunt. If your friend turns around to you in the middle of the high street and says, my name is now Madeline Pryor, you say, all right, girl, go off. Like, I love that for you. Right. No, exactly. You know, all the nuances, but the second that she declared herself Dark Lady, uh, just with that transformation sequence, I was like, you know what, honey, I'm in. I did the Dark Lady transformation from Sailor Moon. Oh, my God. I... Uh... Black Lady, actually, which they translated in the dub to Wicked Lady <laughs> because it had a different connotation outside of Japanese. Yeah, Matthew like, Pryor is He has Black become lady. Black Lady, and I, even at 13, I'm like, mm. So that was one of my favorite parts, actually. I think, like, my, my favorite bits were, A, her just basically being uh, a have-it-all mom. Mm -hmm. She was like, yes, I can have a small baby and be a <laughs> megalomaniac. I can have it all. Too. I can have it all. Like she just put right. the baby down and she did the evil transformation right in the middle of the creek. Well, like, like, shh, mommy's busy. Mommy's was like, busy. that's great. <laughs> yeah, she did. And, and she then, never um, tries to hurt the baby, which is an important change from the comic, obviously. Yes. Where like the thing that they did to fully demonize her to the reader was like, she's going to hurt her child. And I love here yeah. she wants to protect her child, yeah. even when she's evil. And to be honest, to me, I didn't like that change. I like when she's threatening children. I like, I really wanted her to be like floating oh, around with wow. six children that she finds. But they couldn't. They couldn't. I get it. Khalid, please, baby. We, we need, we need the, the infanticide down to like a two with you. You always one. try to stifle me. You always try to stifle me and I don't like <laughs> it. Then one day. Just hit. Ooh, she's mad. <laughs> Carlin always wants the baby kicked out of the window, everyone. <laughs> I get it. I know. Because in comics, it's frustrating to have to deal with the baby. And then it's like, are we going to drop him in limbo? Are we going to send him to the future? Are we going to send him to fairy daycare? What are we going to fucking do? We got to get rid of this baby. So, like, I, well, because they, they're not allowed to grow up is mm -hmm. the problem. Like, if nobody is allowed, if Kamala Khan has to be in high school for the rest of time, then this baby is stuck as a fucking baby. And that's a problem for a story, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> yes it is I, I don't know how Kamala got into this Kamala is like now why am I in it <laughs> <laughs> so I, I love her using white woman tears and invoking the black women to trap Storm would have believed me Storm would have oh. believed me oh. so oh. good also so She's gay and she was crying and I was like, bitch, you know what you're doing. And she walked straight out of that room. She snatched back that baby. And it was, that was great. Second. Storm and I are going to raise this child together without you, is what yes. she's saying there. And I loved it. Sweetheart, I love you. Can you go get the She needs a class. Let's go. I loved the weird gay moment they had in like the first or second episode where she's like, Storm, I just don't know how I'm going to have a difficult conversation with my child about the way that people are going to view him, even though, and she's like, I'm black. This is annoying. You sound like a mother. <laughs> That's my <laughs> storm <laughs> there's a bit where beast calls jeans he says are superfluous jeans but plural like both of them yeah. are superfluous and i went you shady bitch <laughs> that is funny that. he was like so we have a problem with our superfluous jeans and i did laugh then uh it was wolverines the whole morph wolverine thing is very loaded and i'm mm. gonna come yeah that i around. like mm -hmm. say more it was the last bit was when that fucking evil thing came out of the tv and jubilee yeah. jubilee stood on business immediately she didn't mince words she didn't express surprise she cut that thing head straight down the middle and the way that i stand jubilee increased about 78 percent in that moment how can you go from horror movie to insta kill with no break <laughs> yeah actually like let's sit with this morph conversation a little bit because one thing i've been noticing a lot with the discourse that's been happening around the show is there's been a bit of mm. a rebuffing of the sexualization quote unquote of these characters first of all this show is targeted at 30 year old homosexuals like us <laughs> 
This show is not actually like th- if this episode didn't tell you that this is a nostalgia bait show, but also like, I don't know. This is a generation gap thing mm-hmm. because to me, like I grew up watching like Animaniacs and all kinds of like or Looney Tunes, like a yep. body joke here and there for the grown ups is what makes a good kids show. The re- like you don't you want the reason that these shows were so beloved is because the parents enjoyed watching them, too. And the kid doesn't get it. And that's fine. Yeah, I, there was an interesting conversation about morph and i really want someone to talk about the sort of phallic symbolism of popping your claws and how often sure. that works. and when yeah. morph sees wolverine in the shower there's the an erection he does is, yeah. yeah simulate an erection mm. and i was I and was ask like, if he can come in and and touch him yeah yeah, yeah. Well, no i mean and he's already he's been flirting around him the whole time like changing into people that he fancies mm-hmm. morph has got a very strange relationship with wolverine particularly even in the old stuff yeah, yeah. Wolverine loves a chaotic bisexual like he cannot get enough this of is, it honestly this is the answer to the love triangle is that wolverine just yep. needs to get with morph and like they don't need to tell anybody if he's gene sometimes like uh, they no that was actually because they're they're using they them now and i want to respect that so I, i'm just correct myself but also oh, apologies. it is very funny to hear all the characters just like use they them pronouns casually in 1997 without like us talking about it mm-hmm. revisionism do it. that that kind of like wolverine being like a pronoun respecter in 1997 was a little bit like of a huh but i get it because like you know we're making it now yeah. right uh, I just feel like if you're going to set the show in the 90s, it would be interesting if you're going to do this to tackle it in the context of the mm. 90s where mm. like gay was like crazy to people, you know, yeah. like this is a whole other time. But I just think it's like with Bishop where I'm like, if you're going to bring back Morph and make Morph important because you think that Morph can represent a kind of diversity that is resonant, yeah. then you also need to give the character time beyond being a psych gag. And yeah. I personally find the Morph stuff confusing. Using. Mm-hmm. Like there's a shot in one of these episodes where like Warren is there suddenly and then oh no, it's just Morph. And I'm yeah. like, that confused me. I was like, oh, Warren's here because like why not? You know? Mm-hmm. In this one, it was particularly odd because like as an Easter egg for the comics people, him turning into Ilyana is cute. Yeah. But like Ilyana was never in that cartoon. She was a little girl. They never did limbo. She like she was never magic. And Colossus was barely in that cartoon. In this continuity, what is this supposed to represent? Like- so to to borrow from one of your segments, I would say he is. Uh, don't worry about your character <laughs> yeah he's there to just he's there to laugh with the audience yeah and basically crack jokes and transform into someone more useful but yeah. again this is the thing but if this is important like representation yeah then the character can't just show up and be a joke like it's will and grace and mm-hmm. it's a funny mm-hmm. day you know yeah. what i mean like i just think but that but I mean, that's very 90s to be fair for like the queer character to they just are. be like for yucks but i don't know i i want a little more mm-hmm. I, I liked the spiral moment where it was like i'm voting with six arms that was funny yes we we do see like some more layers. The fact that they've hinted back at the history was sinister when they transformed back to their old form. I found that really effective. Also, just to hit on that point with Wolverine, yeah. when they were talking about their past was sinister, I noticed that Wolverine's hand mm-hmm. was on their shoulder, comforting them. So there mm-hmm. is like a thing about intimacy happening there. I feel there is an arc that is developing with Morph, but I'm 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 hoping that's just not a feeling. Mm-hmm. That's actually what's happening. I hope there is. Mm-hmm. I was a little thrown, and I get that again. It's because we've only got thirty minutes. But when it's like it's Mister Sinister. Well, I can show you where he is. And I was like, you can? Yeah. This whole time? Yeah. They just know. They just know. (laughs) Like, Okay, we could have have used that information before Mr. Sinister cloned Gene, but... Yeah, but remember, they had to get off six cunty transformations first, Mm. and who wants to tell you the punchline too early? Who gets to transform into Spiral? Right, if they tell you where where Sinister is, nobody gets to be magic, so, you know, they're doing what they need to do. My favorite bit of the episode is the bit where Magneto and Rogue have booked out the Danger Room all day, and then you're like, oh no, it's just the Inferno, like, causing this to fuck with Gambit, but then later on, they show up like, what happened? We missed the whole thing. I'm like, oh, shit, they were in the danger yeah, room banging yeah. it out. <laughs> so that's fucking yeah. funny. I do like that they're doing the Rogue and Magneto thing. It's a little crazy in this because Magneto is drawn so much older mm-hmm. than he looked in the comic when Some they were together. Like that, no, I know. Me. And like he is older, obviously, but notably when they were together in the comics, he had been de-aged to like 35, right? Mm-hmm. But partly though, it works because 
Lenore Zan is incredible, iconic actress. She does sound more mature now, yeah. she locally. Does. Yeah, and she so does. I think that they they sound appropriate together, which is like an interesting... His voice has changed over time. It was actually really smart to have the Gene actress be Val Cooper in this. I thought that was really good, if you're going to recast. You're really not the first person to say that. I think one of the most consistent things that we've heard is the voice with Rogue thing. It's, it's, it's a little really- bit... It is jarring. Yeah, it's a little bit mature for the character. Mm-hmm. Mm. X-Men! Okay, so the final questions. But before I do that, anything specific that you guys feel like you've not gotten to about the episode? Go for it now. So I think that what Connor's early statement saying that the writing was really good in this, I really agree with. I think this was one of the better written ones. And after reflection, I started thinking that maybe all of the things that I thought were flaws were actually intentionally in there. So, you know, we got the speech about Jean wondering about how she talked to her baby about being normal. I, when I rewatched it in preparation for this episode, I was like, was that meant to be a hint to us that something's off? I think so. The same way that she's like, we have to leave, Scott. It's because that was the intent from Sinister. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, are we meant to, are we meant to distrust this gene? Is she meant to say things that make us go, what, what, what? So when they finally reveal it wasn't her, we go, well, that's why she seemed a bit weird. But in the same way that, that, you know, people are just casually using they, them pronoun. The the way that it's been written, there are certain zeitgeisty modern words that I think are meant to draw really, really sharp parallels with things that are happening today. Because there's mm-hmm. a bit where Magneto... Oh, yeah, because, uh, yeah, so um, Sinister had used mutant genes to... Yes, we're going to punish his powers. appropriations. Yeah, and I was like, that was a very specifically chosen modern that, zeitgeist That one kind word. of pinged out to me a little bit too, but I mean, like, I guess to be fair, like, Bell Hooks was talking about that in the 90s, and Magneto is well-read. You got to give true. him that. So, true, like, true, true. I don't think it's impossible that he would be aware of cultural appropriation in 1997, whereas, like, I do think that all of the X-Men, including, like, Rogue, using they-them pronouns without it having to be explained to them is more like, huh, that because mostly it's just here's the thing I want and I want the non-binary community to have this because I think it would be great. I Hmm. want the scene where Rogue learns about non-binary pronouns because I think that would be incredibly funny and also humanizing in like a, you know, and you do it with like a beloved character who's like not the quickest, right? And you just like have it be here's how it is and have Rogue go, oh, well, that's not so complicated at all or whatever. <laughs> and like, then you move, like, I think that would be cute, right? I would try my best, sugar. But yeah, it's, well, it's like when, it's like when she doesn't know what kind of holidays Gateway celebrates in the comic, but she gives him a present anyway. Yeah. And she's like, yeah. doing my best here. Like, I don't know anything about other races, but I'm mm. trying. And I think similarly, she'd be like, I don't understand a non-binary, but I love that for you. And I'm excited for you, you know, <laughs> like, I just think something like that. But well, yeah, we don't have that much time for the interpersonal combos mm. in this. Mm. But, but that's, I mean, that's because they're making way for, for the kicking ass shit. Which I've done <laughs> mad guess. about, to be clear. Yeah, right. That's great. But when is somebody going to punch someone else in the stomach? That's, <laughs> I, I well, like not in the first two episodes, because that was not the time. <laughs> mm. But I, I, do you know what? And this, this gives me, to jump back into something we said earlier, it gives me a little bit of hope for the whole uh, depowered storm business. Because... They've managed to make psychic battle really fucking interesting to see. Mm-hmm. And yeah. the, the, the art direction on this is incredible. Psychic battles have always been fucked over when it comes to depictions. Like yes. we have so, so long just of just like people your drowning at each other, like yeah. pinching their temples. And here now we are on so many drugs and we are so medicated that we can <laughs> we can think of shit that people in the 90s really couldn't. Like we would tr- <laughs> they tr- out. <laughs> Yeah, like the part where Jean is like, swim in your own womb, Madeline, and think about being a mother. I'm like, this is insane. But it's also very much like the Simon Claremont comics in mm. Inferno, where they're like brain locked and you get to see cool shit. And it's cool to see that in an adaptation. Mm. So, yeah, I mean, I think that Storm is going to kick the shit out of Cyclops and it's going to look great. That's the thing is I think that's where this is going. Yeah. But I get I but I empathize with your your position on Storm and her powers and the action sequences being the real stars here. Oh, definitely. Because when cause when Madeline mixed it up, when Madeline did the fucking roll and then the hand to hand shit beating off the bits of glass, and the, the, it was it was it was good. So it, good. And they beat. <laughs> Question time. We got four questions. Okay. Answer them quick fire. You can talk about them for a couple of sentences, but no more. So, number one, who is your winner of the episode? X-Men. 
Yeah. Madeline, easy. I think that this was, this is her first showing in multimedia in a major way. And it is a sympathetic portrayal that underlines everything important about the character to lay people who only watch the cartoon. And I think that in a new era that is meant to be more of a, perhaps, I, I don't know, but I'm guessing is meant to be, in the comics, I mean, that's meant to be more of a jump on for new readers. I was pretty worried that Madeline was going to get shuffled back off to Buffalo pretty quick <laughs> after her strong showing the last few years. And now I think, well, she's in the cartoon. She's not confusing anymore because they explained her in 25 minutes yeah. to regular people. So I think that as a character, she won this really hardcore, even if the canon of it was different, the emotional heart was there and the iconic Jean has an evil sister who does magic thing that now people are going to be more aware of. So I think she's the big winner. Ash. I agree. Madeline, because she can stick and roll. She, and also the speed <laughs> at which she went evil. Like that was hilarious to me. She had one conversation and she was like, fuck this baby. But clap if you ever wanted to kill somebody. Mind control diamond on her forehead. <laughs> don't mind that. Don't mind that. She went into that. <laughs> don't mind that. No, I, I support her going evil she, anyway. Yeah. You're making excuses for her. <laughs> I'm already building my defense case, right? It's just my, it's my natural inclination. I'm sorry. I fucking love that. There was no like, do you know how sometimes you get like three episodes of like hand wringing and oh, what's wrong with me? Nah. No, she was she all dust, in. She dusted it. She put the baby down. She put the, she put the under boobs out. She said, right, let's get to it. Started rolling, throwing, killing. It was incredible. This is the safe zone for Madeline Defense. We support women's wrongs in this podcast. Uh, <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> for my end, I'm going to give more for the winner of the episode. Who is your loser of the episode? Nixon. Nathan. Mm. Nathan was just, I'm, I, I've i never felt that sad for a baby. <laughs> it's Take, pretty sad. Born, taken, yanked, passed, parents gone. That ain't your real mum. Thrown in a vat, taken out, mm. shit start crawling on you, through the portal. It is his real mum. That's important to the episode. Who's this guy? Like, it's just... <laughs> <laughs> Poor Nathan, I felt so bad. Yeah, that's, he had a tough time. Mm. A short one, but tough. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's about to be real long in the dystopian future, so. <laughs> My big loser of the episode actually is Scott. I can't be a part of this. I'm sorry. I think that it, it successfully adapted the shitty parts of Scott and Madeline's marriage in very quick rapid fire form to justify the, the arc of the episode, but it didn't give him the good stuff that he gets later when they were trying to rehab the character with Nathan. Yeah. Like when he's just like, I can't deal with this. I'm leaving like about sending the baby to the future when that's actually one of Cyclops is like most important moments in all of comics is when he has to make the decision to send his child away and it's like a really that's a really important scene for him in like his history so i thought while i was happy that madeline got to have it and got to like deliver that speech that was so nice i think it's a bummer for scott but it contributes to my suspicion that they're building toward the Scott and Aurora thing because like the Scott and Aurora thing is part of the Scott and Madeline thing in the comic that happens mm. during so I think if it's going to happen later he has to still be kind of acting immature at this stage right so it's like I would have just had him be there even if you want Madeline to give the speech that's all yeah for my end I I'm going to disagree with the class and I'm going to say that my loser of the episode is Beast. Sure. He's not getting enough heat for his bedside manner. He just threw it out there. Hey, Gene, <laughs> you you ain't real. Yeah, yeah. Could have pulled her aside. You're right. right. He even had Petri dishes still in his hand. He was holding her like DNA samples physically. <laughs> like, look at it. It's all fucked yeah. up. He said, there are two beautiful girls standing in front of me. And you're both superfluous. <laughs> Uh, I hate that. <laughs> okay, now, what is your gayest moment of the episode? I think that's easy. That's, I mean, the the whole, the, the, the shower scene is... And we both yeah. agree? Also, Storm would have believed me is also a wildly gay moment that I liked. <laughs> yes. I, I feel like you like that because that's a very Housewives-esque... <laughs> moment i also just i love storm and madeline's relationship in the comics so i just like i was like yes queen say that <laughs> out back here <laughs> i think it was when magneto and i've said this on uh x the platform that you <laughs> are you on on <laughs> i can't i can't onboard twitter anymore i can't i'm sorry <laughs> Fair, Fair play. I I chose when Magneto threw an entire chandelier at Maddie in the middle of her sentence and then turned up into 
out elbow long velvet gloves and said, you brimstone clone. <laughs> then Maddie, just for the girls, <laughs> ripped all his clothes off and yeah. i was like you know what she gets it like she is yes. the truest ally of mm -hmm. them all really at the end of the day she knows yeah, what we're here that, for that, that was it mm -hmm. he's very bitchy in this which he i like he's very like, bitchy yeah like throwing a whole chandelier it, they're doing the stepdad vibe from the 80s in a way that is really that was gay then and is gay now yeah but he's also campy and rude in a way that I love because like throwing yeah. a whole chandelier at somebody while they're speaking, I now aspire to floating just high enough over people to look down on them. It's never a strategic mm. advantage. He never has no. to actually fly. He just wants to impress on you that you are small. <laughs> <laughs> She's showing <Yeah>. out. <laughs> I'm excited for whenever the bitch Val Cooper reveals her true evil scheme and they're going to have like a bitch off. Like I'm excited. <laughs> about I really hope she's not just mystique in disguise. I've seen people saying that and yeah. like yeah. I, that does happen in the comic at one point <laughs> so I can see it but I just want her to be like full on just a nasty piece of work <laughs> I, I want it so the bad. full Warhawk, that's what she should be. Yeah. My gayest moment is when Jean woke up and then she put her hair in that hair tie. Immediately in the ponytail. Yes, and that's just a pure lesbian movie. She's like, all right, I'm ready for work now. Let's go. <laughs> 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 that was like a very rare standing Jean moment. I was like, yes, sis, you better get in that hair tie. It made me laugh because I was just like, she's like, shit, I remember now. It's the 90s cartoon. I have to have a ponytail. Because like she doesn't do that. <laughs> We're fucking up the brand. Oh, no. Uh, but, but also it's really important well the weirdest thing is that then in the next scene she doesn't have the ponytail on the astral mm. plane because I assumed the reason they were doing it is because and this is true in the 80s comics it's important that Jean and Madeline have different haircuts yes. so that you can tell them apart and so I thought they were just like ponytail that's Jean long hair that's Madeline but then she had long hair too it was fine they kept her to her lazy laying down roots because she yes. got the hair and then moved absolutely nowhere I don't need my body I'm just gonna lie in bed while I <laughs> save the day I I love that. The idea that she projected herself in a sickening outfit like 600 miles away to be <laughs> to beat her twin's ass without ever moving <laughs> out of the bed was yeah, anti-capitalist. Really queen. strong. <laughs> Capitalist yes. <laughs> I identify with Jean as someone who takes a lot of naps, so I also enjoy when she has nap time. I identify with Jean as someone who always thinks they're correct, despite being often horribly wrong. Uh, <laughs> horribly, horribly wrong. Uh, uh, yeah, that track. Okay, fuck you. Uh, I thought we were friends. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> Mom, stop. She is the only, like, canonical Pisces, and I have to sit with that all the time. So... You know. Oh, God. <laughs> You've lost me. You've lost me. <laughs> okay, final question. What is the blackest moment of this episode? X-Men! Connor, you may answer the whitest moments of this episode. Oh, okay. I was like, you're not making me do this, are you? That's not, that's really not my prerogative. This is an accessible podcast. We accommodate our Sure. Guests. The whitest moment of this episode is... Huh, that's actually, so there've been so many in the first two. This one, I feel like, was less <laughs> audacious in that respect. Mm -hmm. I mean, I do think that Gene, like, it is an episode where everybody is just like, Gene, oh no, Gene, 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 And like, the beautiful white woman is in danger element to the episode. It's kind of like a missing mm -hmm. white woman syndrome episode, mm -hmm. except they're not missing. It's the opposite. There's two of them and that's the problem, but we're still like obsessed, right? Uh, <laughs> right. So that I, I would say, I guess, mm -hmm. at the end of the day. Also, it's like all about like the sanctity of white motherhood at the end of the day, which is like a big yeah. white people obsession. Mm. How about you, Ash? What is your blackest moment of the episode? Ooh, no, you go first. I've got, Me? I've got two, but I have to decide. You go first. My blackest moment of the episode is there's something felt very, very black about the way <laughs> that Maddie was kind of telling them off right before she like ran away with her baby in a bubble. I don't know why that just resonated with me. Kind of Diane Carroll dynasty energy. Yes. Yeah. When I saw the eyeshadow, when I saw the hair just going, I was like, she's 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 light skinned. She is yellow bone. That is a sister. <laughs> I love that for her. <laughs> that is my black okay. moment. Okay. Okay. All right. What are your two, Ash? <laughs> Bishop leaving. <laughs> so far, so far, if there's they've contrived to take the black people out of the team, but there is something very, very powerful about black people just wanting to leave. It was Maddie who suggested it to go back to college point. She was like, You want to just bounce with the kid? You you got a you got an armband. Yeah. Yeah. But the fact like he sat there and he did the big 
you know, the big double blast. Also, I don't really understand why Scott had to blast him. Mm. It, it, it feels like the same thing in two steps. Like Scott could have done. Well, because it was just a way to show up Bishop's power before we write him out, just like they did with Storm in the first episode. We want yeah. to sh- we want to give it's, them a cool moment exactly. before they disappear for a couple episodes. Mm. Yeah. But my, my lead in black moment was the fact that, okay, the first time in the first episode, the first time you see Storm and Bishop, they come in, mm-hmm. they fight together for 15 seconds. And then something that shouldn't knock down either of them puts them both laying down. And I was like, solidarity, <laughs> let them reparations, let them white folk do the work. So they, they came in, they did a couple blasts, boom. And they went, oh no. Well, Jean style, like if Jean's going to do it, then Storm should get to do it, in my opinion. Boom. Mm-hmm. It said rest black rest is radical. Take a nap, girl. And Bishop said the same shit. He went through one hard episode. They turned that house into a into a horoscope. He looked at that hell sentinel and he went, Oh I'm going back to my evil future. And it was hilarious to me. There we go. Supernatural shit start leaving and the last black character dipped out of the mansion. <laughs> Like their Ouija board shit and he was out. Yeah, he saw the face in the elevator. He said, Mm-mm, this is you lot. <laughs> Pass me that, baby. <laughs> that was it. That was my one. Okay. Do we have any final thoughts? I liked it. I thought it was good. I'm excited to see what they do next. These that I the first three were what they showed at the premiere. So I had seen all of these already and I haven't seen any of the other mm-hmm. ones. So I'm excited to see where it goes next. Uh, I think that it's striking the right balance of like nostalgia and bringing in comic stories that they've never done before. Uh, I'm intrigued to see how they do life death because I think it is, I mean, as I said, I, I, it's my favorite storm story, but I think it's also one that would be very easy to fuck up. I mean, that's why I think it's bold to do it. Right. And I'm, I'm excited to hear the actress mm. deliver some of those lines because in that voice, because she's going to kill that, I'm sure. But like, we'll kill see. It. It's a perfect thing to adapt for this cartoon, though, because Life Death, the issue is like a bottle episode of the comic. Right. Like, so you could just do that whole episode is just them at Eagle Plaza or whatever. And it could be cool, if, especially if you make it kind of like thriller horror. you like, what's he up to? Like, I think you could do cool stuff with it. But I mm. don't know. We'll see. I really like the episode. I think it's the perfect way mm-hmm. to do nostalgia, actually. It's quick. It's condensed. It reminds me of things that I like in ways that aren't exhaustive or overplayed. And the stitching even makes it more interesting for me to watch it again. Those slight Thinking differences mean yeah. that there's always something. Yeah. Like when Bishop takes Nathan to the future, I was like, fuck, are they going to come back friends? Right. Like, how are they going to build the antagonism? Into uh, Are they going to have like a they father-son must, they dynamic must, right? now? It's sort of the reverse of the weird MCU thing where like Monica Rambeau is Carol's daughter. Which I hate. Yeah, but. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it was it was really interesting to watch. That's it. <laughs> Love Tiana Paris. Not a criticism of the actresses. They're doing they're doing that fine. I just that choice is baffling to me still to this day. All right, and <laughs> that completes episode three. Thanks for having me, guys. Thank this you. was so fun. <laughs> it was good to see you. I'm proud mm-hmm. of us. I think we did yeah, no, job. I'm actually quite impressed with us. Okay, wait. I'm- This episode was hosted by Asha Lane of The Immortal X of Words. You can find that everywhere you get your podcasts. And it was hosted and produced by Khalid and Nas of Reverential. You can also find that podcast everywhere you get your podcasts. You can also find Cerebro everywhere that you listen to your podcasts. Find Connor on Instagram at Cerebrocast and at Connor Goldsmith. You can find Ash at Van the First and me at Also Perp everywhere. But you got to make sure to follow both podcasts because we'll be alternating. So episode three is going to show up on my feed. And then episode four is going to show up on the Immortal X of Words feed the week after. And so on until episode 10, the finale, where we will go back to sharing. So make sure you stay up to date. And give us five stars and a nice rating. Make us want to come back. All right. Thank you for listening. Goodbye. Hey, Pete!